Welcome to Yoga Santa Barbara Style. This program showcases Santa Barbara area yoga teachers by presenting a brief interview along with a 25-minute practice featuring the guest instructor. Today, our guest will be Marie Thorne Thompson. Marie currently teaches at Yoga Soup. My name is Ray Colby and I'm the host of Yoga Santa Barbara Style. I've been practicing yoga for a number of years and I'm here to share my passion for yoga with you. We've got a great show for you today. In addition to our yoga sequence and interview, I'll present the first in a series on the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali and we'll break down the pose Utita Trikonasana or Triangle Pose. Sarah Remick will discuss yoga teacher training and here's a spoiler, it's not just for teachers. And she'll give us some yummy food for thought, highlighting the benefits of the wonderful aloe vera plant. So let's get right to it. Here's Sarah with Yoga News. <laughs> Thank you, Ray. Doing yoga is a practice that for most is life-altering in the best possible way. Teaching yoga is another layer to the expansion of being that occurs on so many levels through the practice of yoga asana and philosophy. And while teaching may not be a goal for every student, there is so much to be gained from the experience of a teacher training, whether you decide to teach publicly, privately, just your close friends or family after a few glasses of wine, or even not at all. Going through my 200-hour yoga teacher training facilitated some of the most profound body and spirit connections I have ever made. After I graduated, teaching yoga in the conventional sense was not really my focus. I was so affected by the experience of the training, by the process that myself and the other students went through, that I just wanted to soak it up and sit in it. It was like I wanted to let the wisdom of this new, awakened, heightened awareness saturate my cells so it would stay with me. Whether I taught in a studio for money or not, I knew that I never wanted to stop getting deeper into yoga. I knew that I wanted to attend workshops, intensives, and more teacher trainings to deepen my practice, deepen my connection to my heart and to spirit. I loved the physical challenge, the dedication and commitment to the practice. I treasured the emotional release and the energetic cleansing that occurred through the practice. And I have been forever changed in the best possible way. So if you think you might be interested in experiencing a teacher training for yourself, here in our little beach town, we have many options for attending teacher trainings at the 200 hour, 300 hour, or 500 hour level as well as workshops or intensives that emphasize something specific. Santa Barbara has had a long-standing yoga community, and in the last few years we have seen a surge in new yoga studios, everywhere from Gulita to Montecito and more. Summer can be a time when we embark on new journeys or start adventures. We are so blessed here in Santa Barbara to have had several local studios hosting teacher trainings this summer, and more to come in the winter. Gigi Snyder from the world-renowned Yoga Works led a 200-hour teacher training at the eclectic and cozy Yoga Soup Studio downtown. The Yoga Works training took place on weekends from July 14th through November 11th. Local favorite Santa Barbara Yoga Center holds their teacher trainings as separate workshops. The basics for the 200-hour level went from August 3rd through the 12th as a 10-day intensive covering 47 hours of training time. White Lotus Foundation founders Gonga White and Tracy Rich held their 200-hour teacher training August 11th through the 26th. Because of the nature of White Lotus, there are retreat accommodations available whenever you go there for a training or classes. More trainings are coming our way this winter. Stay tuned in the next coming weeks for more information. Each of these trainings varies greatly, and I highly encourage you to do some research and see what program, institution, philosophy, and instructor resonates with you. Check out their websites, read testimonials, and follow your inner guide. The experience of teacher training is transformative and unique. Honor your instinct and get ready to elevate your life experience to another plane. 
Nadi Sadhana, or the sweet breath, is a simple form of alternate nostril breathing suitable for beginning and advanced students. Nadi means channel and refers to the energy pathways through which prana flows. Sadhana means cleansing. So Nadi Sadhana means channel cleaning. The benefits include calming the mind, soothing anxiety and stress, balancing the left and right hemispheres, and it promotes clear thinking. Here's how to do it. Hold your right hand up and curl your index and middle fingers toward your palm. Place your thumb next to your right nostril and your ring finger and pinky by your left. Close the right nostril by pressing gently against it with your thumb and inhale through the left nostril. The breath should be slow, steady, and full. Now close the left nostril by pressing gently against it with your ring finger and pinky and open your right nostril by re relaxing your thumb and exhale fully with a slow and steady breath. Inhale through the right nostril, close it, and then exhale through the left nostril. That's one complete round of Nadi Sadhana. Inhale through the left, exhale through the right, inhale through the right, exhale through the left. Begin with five to ten rounds and add more as you feel ready. Remember to keep your breathing slow, easy, and full. You can do it just about any time and anywhere. Try it as a mental warm-up before meditation to help calm the mind and put you in the mood. You can also do it as part of your centering before beginning an asana or posture routine. Also, try it at times throughout the day. Nadi Sadhana helps control stress and anxiety. If you start to feel stressed out, 10 or so rounds will help calm you down. It also helps soothe anxiety caused by flying or other fearful or stressful situations. In good health, namaste. Today our guest is Marie Thorne Thompson. She teaches at Yoga Soup and also at Cathedral Oaks Athletic Club. Hi Marie, welcome to the show. Hi Ray, thanks for having me. Oh, it's an honor, thank you so much for, for coming. So Marie, how long have you been practicing yoga? Uh, I've been practicing yoga for 22 years now. And uh, I took my first class when I was 19 years old at the Santa Barbara Yoga Center actually, right when they opened. And uh, that was the beginning of a of a new life. Oh, nice. And how long have you been teaching yoga? Um, I received my teacher's training in 2010 on Maui with uh, Nikki Doan and Eddie Modestini. It was a, an incredible experience and so just three years so far. Yeah. Nikki Doan, I understand, is an Ashtanga teacher. Yes. And so is Ashtanga what you teach or what style of yoga do you teach? Uh, Maya yoga is very much a fusion of Ashtanga and Iyengar and I definitely um, model my classes, my practice after that as well. And, and what do you consider to be some of the greatest benefits associated with yoga? Um, yoga balance for me right now in my life, um, for everybody it's different. Uh, but I know that um, physically yoga is an incredible uh, balancing remedy. It balances your heart rate. It balances your endocrine system. It balances um, our muscles and joints and bones. Um, so physically there's that aspect that's, that's so nourishing. And then of course um, emotionally, spiritually, mentally, there's all of that balance going on as well. And it brings it all together. Class for me is very much a sanctuary, um, as it is, I think, for everybody that makes it to a class, whether it's mine or anybody else's. Um, the hardest part is getting there. And so when I arrive, when the students arrive, I really try to set a tone um, of a sacred space. So, you know, we say our intentions. You have every opportunity to um, heal yourself in every sense. and. I talk about it a lot and, and really bring a lot of things to the surface. So it's a healing space, it's a sacred space, um, it's, it's a quiet space um, with a little bit of fun music and thrown in. <laughs> we do a strong asana practice regardless because nothing really gets to the core um, like wearing yourself out a little bit with yoga. and. Um, 
Yeah, I really try to go into the um, higher conscious, try to tap into the higher self and, uh, and work on that level. In the beginning, I typically like to start with a uh, guided meditation, um, a little bit of pranayama work. And in that beginning, there's sort of the tone is set as to sort of where the focus might be or maybe some of the information that we're going to talk about for that day. And then I like to break out sort of towards the three-quarter mark of my class and focus on something. So whether it's the psoas, maybe it's hips, maybe it's shoulders. So at that point, everything's kind of come to somewhat of a standstill and we're really going deep into maybe a handful of postures from there and working a specific area. And then um, from there, you know. And then throughout the practice, it all sort of falls into, it all just, you know, works. And what do you think are the biggest risks associated with yoga? You know, uh, just people kind of jumping into it um, too fast and maybe just coming into it uh, for a purely physical experience, I guess. And with that said, you know, if you, if, sometimes I see a lot of athletes come in and um, they're somewhat competitive, mostly with themselves and they feel they should be able to do these things and, um, and they hurt themselves. And I've also hurt myself a lot just feeling like I should be able to do something. So the risk I think is our self and um, the ego, of course. My focus and what I teach a lot of is just slowing down big time in our practice and the transitions and taking our time to get from one place to the next is so important and huge. So you think that, that the, the biggest risks are based on the ego and us, us pushing ourselves too hard yes. and that they tend to occur predominantly in transitions yes, or coming yes. into or going out of a pose? Yes. Um, and so in your, in your practice or in your teaching, how do you address that risk? Um, I, I feel like a broken record um, often and it is just that, to slow down, to take your time, to breathe and um, make each moment really count, really matter, and that the transition is just as important as the actual postures themselves. Why do you teach yoga? I was actually in the corporate world for my beginning part of my young life, and uh, after having children and the you know, mortgage meltdown and the kind of financial collapse, it just didn't make sense for me to go back to work. And so I just thought I would try to start to do something that I loved. And when I used to be, a, a, you know, working behind the desk, I would always just say, oh, God, if I could just do yoga all day or, you know, go to the beach or whatever, if I could just invest my time and energy on something that I love instead of working for, you know, this giant company, imagine how much I could get accomplished. And so that actually fulfilled itself. And um, so as soon as I stepped foot that first time and actually started teaching other students, this whole epiphany occurred and I realized I had so much information and so much knowledge to share from all of my past teachers. And I heard their words coming through me when I was you know, out there in front of those um, one or two people, <laughs> you know, when you just get started. And uh, it, I was, it just all, you know, it just clicked at that moment. Who have been your, some of your favorite teachers and why? Um, well, Nikki and Eddie, of course. Uh, Deb Dobbin is one of my sincerest favorites and I'm just so thankful that she's still teaching and doing what she does here. Um, <clears throat> many of the local instructors, Denise Zavaridis is amazing, Heather Tiddens, um, Cynthia Apeldothia I love as well. Um, aside from that, in my earlier years, I did live in San Diego for several years. I practiced with Tim Miller and several of his um, uh, folks down there. And so he, I actually love to comment on him because he's a, a teacher of little words. He doesn't say much except the cadence of Sanskrit, of the Ashtanga, you know, the whole nine yards, is that French? And, um, but he held a, an energy that was unlike 
any other. It really felt quite authentic and you know, the whole class would always get into this sink of breath for a good two hours, which was pretty incredible. Um, but you'd never see him do a posture. I don't think I ever saw him do one. He just kind of walked you know, the line. So he was incredible. And so he was a true teacher in the sense that you know, I had no idea what his abilities were, but it didn't matter because he was a teacher. He was a master. Um, Nikki, Eddie, Tim, Sarah Powers was my first. And she blew my mind. She kind of got it all started, shattered the illusion. <laughs> so I thank her for the beginning. <laughs> and if someone wants to follow your activities, find out what classes you're teaching, what times and locations, et cetera, um, is there some way that they can follow that? Do you have a web presence or something? Absolutely. I have a website. It is mariethornthompson.com, no dash. Uh, so I have a website, it has all my schedules and um, little information about me, a blog, which I like to write sometimes and tell fun stories. So that's always nice to check out as well. Well, uh, Marie, it's been such a pleasure having you here. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so, so much, much for coming down to visit with us. Thank you. And namaste. Namaste. Thank you. So, ooh, jai. Pranayama, the yogic breath. Begin to lengthen and deepen both the inhales and exhales. And gently lift the sternum, roll the shoulders to the back body. And bringing your hands to heart center. Setting your intention for your practice today, something to dedicate it to. A wish, a prayer, an affirmation. A manifestation. Get really clear. Use this collective energy, this space, to put it out there. <clears throat> And let's begin with one ohm together. Inhaling. Opening your eyes. Let's come on to all fours. And with that same sense of grounding presence, the moment those hands touch the ground, really tune in, send your intelligence there. Now, spread the fingers wide, press into the entire palm Bring your entire, all of your intelligence into those hands. Plug in so that there's not a space underneath them. And notice when you press into the palm, into the knuckles, there's no weight in the wrist. They lift. Curl the toes, lift the hips, and press back to downward dog. And keep that action in those hands. Anytime they're on the ground, any posture, they are active. They are awake. They are your footing, your grounding, your base. And it's when the hands are absent that our practice starts to get tiring and hard because the work is in the wrist and the triceps. And bend the knees, child's pose. 
Bring the hands back by your sides. Really drop that head down into the ground, into the earth. This place of new beginnings. And then reach the arms forward. Look at the hands, set them up, lift the forearms off the floor. Really turn the arms on. So there's so much work just in awareness. And then curl the toes, lift the hips. Come all the way back up, downward dog. Take three breaths. Let the head go. Starting fresh, brand new day, brand new body, brand new mind. Good, one more breath. And look between your hands, step forward. Take a nice deep inhale, lengthen. And exhale, fold, let the head go. Again, inhale, lift, lengthen. And exhale, fold. Start to wake up the feet. Big inhale. And exhale, fold. And then bend the knees. Engage that space in the belly between the belly button and the pubic bone. Pull it up and roll up one vertebrae at a time. Head comes up last, roll the shoulders back. Lift the arms, reach up, grab hold of the left wrist, reach it up to the ceiling, lengthen, press into the left foot, left leg. Shift the hips to the left. Open. Good, back to center. Other side, grab hold of the right wrist. Reach up. Press into the right heel, the right foot. Shift the hips out. And back to center, hook the thumbs, lift up. Reach back. And exhale, forward fold with all that space, all that length. Big inhale, half lift. And exhale, plant the hands, step it back, plank. Take a breath. Elbows in tight, slowly to chaturanga, pause. And all the way to the floor. Bhujangasana, hands under the shoulders, inhale, lift, exhale, release, two more, inhale, lift, good, shoulders away from the ears, and exhale, let it go, one more, inhale, tush is soft, and exhale, good, interlace the hands behind you, Bring the ankles together, feet stay on the floor. Inhale, lift the heart. Reach those arms back. Super strong, super straight. Yes, good, roll the heart up. Beautiful. Two more breaths, wake up the back. Good, now add the feet. Lift, squeeze the glutes, the back of the hamstring. Wake up the entire body. Two more breaths. Beautiful, one more. Now keep all that lift. Keep the legs up, bring the hands by your ribs. Just touch the toes and press up to plank. All the way up. Yes, one unit. And back to downward dog. Breathe, couple of breaths. Check your hands, your feet, your foundation. Drop in. Look between your hands. Step or jump. 
Inhale. And exhale, fold. Big inhale, all the way up. And exhale, hands to heart. Good, Surya Namaskar A. Inhale, lift, reach. And exhale, fold. Big inhale. And exhale, plant the hands, step it back. Chaturanga, stay light, elevated. Upward dog. And downward dog. Press it back. Good luck between your hands. Step or jump. The inhale offers your heart. And exhale, fold. Plug into the feet. Inhale all the way up. Hands to heart. Exhale. Again. Inhale, lift. Reach up. And exhale, fold. Use your breath. Inhale. Exhale, chaturanga, you go. Big inhale, urdhva mukha. And exhale, adho mukha. Three breaths. Breathe. Good. Look between the hands, step or jump. Inhale. And exhale, fold. Plug into the feet, inhale, all the way up. And exhale, hands to heart. Utkatasana, bend the knees. Inhale, reach up, take five breaths. Sit low. Press the knees together, pull the lower belly in. Draw the shoulders down the back. Hands together, let's take a twist. Left elbow, right leg. Shoot the tail back. Press into the palms. Where's the belly? Pull it in. One more breath. Inhale, Utkatasana, reach up, two breaths. Get grounded. Find the heels here. Hands together, other side. Breathe. Open, twist. Ah, let it feel good. Good. Inhale, Utkatasana, one breath. And exhale. Fold, straighten those legs. Big inhale. Exhale, chaturanga. Plant those hands. Step or jump back. Inhale, urdhva mukha. Exhale, adho mukha. Good, lift the right leg, reach it up. Squeeze those glutes. Press it up there. And exhale, knee to nose, hold. Three breaths. Pull it in, engage those abdominals. One more. Now look between your hands and place that foot down, warrior one. Plant the feet, come all the way up. Square those shoulders, square the hips. Beautiful, warrior two, open it up. Squeeze the shoulder blades together like you're holding a pencil between them. Nice, and that presses the heart forward. Gaze just beyond the middle finger. And inhale, reverse. Reach up, up, up. Open that space between the hip and the shoulder. Breathe, reach back. And exhale, elbow to knee, left arm at an angle. Press into that back leg. Good, inhale, warrior two. Reverse. 
Exhale, right hand to the inside, left arm reaching up, bind shoulder and knee, stack wrist over wrist, create wings with those arms, and plug into the feet. Good, look to the floor, release. Left hand down, right arm up, twist. Come on to those back toes. How's that back leg? Straighten it, strengthen it. Good, right hand down, look at that back foot, plant it. Come all the way up, warrior two. Reverse. Parsva Konasana, right hand to the outside. Left arm at an angle. And release that left hand down, right arm up, twist. Breathe. Keep drawing that right femur head back. The left forward and squeeze the sit bones together. Mula Bandha, natural here. Good, release, Chaturanga. Stay light, keep the belly engaged. Urdva Mukha and Adha Mukha. Press it back, couple of breaths. Lift the left leg, reach it up. Engage, bring all of your intention, your willpower into every single action. Lift, reach up. Good, exhale, knee to nose, squeeze and curl, shoulders over wrist. For one more breath, look between your hands, plant that foot, warrior one. Come all the way up. Warrior one, square those arms, those shoulders, the hips. Warrior two, open it up. All that much more force. Shoulder blades. Beautiful. Nice Indra. Energy out the fingers. Good. Reverse. Reach up and back. Open. Lengthen. And exhale, elbow to knee. Right arm at an angle. Find that back leg. Straighten it. Warrior two. And reverse. Exhale, left hand to the inside. Right arm reaching up. Line them up. And release, right hand down, left arm up, twist. Draw that left femur back. Right forward, good, open, stamp into that back leg. Good, left hand down, chaturanga. Big inhale, urdva mukha. Squeeze the belly, lift the hips, press it up to down dog. Breathe. Good, look between your hands, step or jump. Take an inhale and exhale, fold. Inhale, all the way up. Hands to heart. All right, child's pose. Take a rest, rest those shoulders, rest the mind. Let it go. And then gently rolling up to your knees. You can face the middle of the room if you're at the wall. And we'll come into Ustrasana. One quick back bend. <laughs> Camel. So knees are hip distance apart. Let's curl the toes under. The hands are going to press into the hips and they're gonna press them forward. So there's about three stages for, well, there's many stages, but three that I break it down to. The belly is contracted. So even though it's lengthening, it's strong. So here's stage one, the shoulders roll back and you're just gazing slightly up. 
Stage two is dropping the head, opening the throat. And stage three is grabbing the heels and breathing, expanding into the shape. Take any one of the three. And then slowly, the head coming up last like a sack of potatoes, come up. And release child's pose. One more big breath. Use the belly. Gently roll up one vertebrae at a time. Good. And then just shift the hips to the side. Let's come into a wide straddle. Pull the flesh out from the cheeks and try to find the center of those sit bones. If this is difficult, use a blanket to lift yourself. Anything to support a flat spine. And then gently walk those hands forward. Let's come into a simple cross. One minute. Silent meditation. And when you're ready, laying back for Shavasana. Get nice and comfy. Support yourself. Stay warm. Cover your eyes, if possible, with a shirt or a blanket. Take a nice deep breath in. Reach the arms over the head. Stretch into your fingers and toes. And gently roll on to one side. And take a moment there. And then gently pressing up to seated, eyes closed. And we'll close with one ohm together, inhaling. Ah. Stay.
Welcome to Food for Thought. Of all the plants that grow so well in this Mediterranean climate of Santa Barbara, aloe vera is a true healer with varying medicinal properties. Not to be confused with the ginormous, awe-inspiring agave or yucca plants that adorn homes and trailheads of Santa Barbara, nor the varying succulents that are the kin of our beloved aloe vera, aloe stands on its own with numerous uses, both topically and internally, by people all over the globe. Aloe is called Kumari in Sanskrit, which means goddess, and a goddess she is. Aloe is probably most well known as a skin healer. The gooey gel of the plant is vulnerary. It promotes tissue repair. Aloe's capacity for healing burns of all types is unparalleled. After a spontaneous long beach day, my friend acquired a fresh, bright red sunburn. At the end of the day, I gave him a treatment of fresh aloe all over the burn parts, and within hours, literally, the redness was fading into pink, the burning was gone, and by the next morning, the pink shade had turned into a light tan color. Aloe is so healing for wounds or injuries of all sorts. Cuts, bug bites, bruises, acne and blemishes, poison oak, welts, skin ulcers, and eczema. Women in East India use aloe daily to maintain beauty and counteract symptoms of aging. Ayurvedic medicine reveres aloe for its vitalizing and tonic properties for women. Chinese medicine touts aloe as the best kidney yin herbal tonic for building liver yin. Here's a beautiful aloe plant here. You can see that it's aloe. It has the little, little tiny spikes on the side and the inside of the leaves is, it feels like there's some soft stuff in there. Um, when you take a leaf off the aloe plant, you want to make sure to grab as close as possible to the heart of the plant. So I'm going to choose this guy and I'm just going to get in there and try to get, and you can see I've grabbed almost the entire leaf. Rather than just tearing it off in the middle, you can, you can get right at the base of it, like that. When you have the leaf of aloe, you can see that there's all these little spikies along the side. So I'm just going to take a knife, and I'm just going to, I've got amazing yellow sap leaking out everywhere. So you just kind of take the sides off with your knife like that. And we'll do both sides. Try to take as little of the inside as possible. And then you can see there's the gel inside. And I'm just going to put the knife through. You can see all the beautiful gooey gel inside. And you can do this lots of different ways. You can just take the leaf and slap it right on the skin and just rub like that. Um, rub it in really good. Sometimes it can leave a little bit of a, a white residue if you don't rub it in really good. So just rub it in. Um, I like to optimize as much of my aloe as possible. So once I've taken off the first gooey layer, I kind of just take my thumb and and scrape out more of the gel, get all the really thick stuff, and you can just, you can really literally just put it anywhere on the body. Um, you can get a lot of aloe gel out of this. You would be really surprised at how much you can get out of one little leaf. Now, aloe vera's healing power extends deeper into the body when ingested. Aloe vera juice is best in its whole leaf form with no extra water added and preferably with the yellow sap still in the end product, the yellow sap I showed you before. According to Dr. Robert Davis, PhD microbiologist and renowned aloe vera researcher, the entire leaf may contain as many as 200 active elements not available in the inner gel alone. The valuable yellow sap is only found in whole leaf aloe vera products. Many companies filter out all of the yellow sap, even if whole leaf is indicated. Aloe vera is a succulent with 99% of the juice being water and 1% containing the 200 beneficial solids or active ingredients. By concentrating the aloe, it costs the consumer less money for more value. 
Studies show that whole leaf aloe vera juice concentrate can help to provide relief from allergies and hay fever due to pollen, dander, chemicals, perfume, dust mites, and foods. Allergies can be brought on by many factors. The number one support in helping to reduce the constant challenge of allergies is to strengthen the connective tissue called collagen. Weak collagen tissue in nasal passages, lung tissues, and in the walls of the intestine allow foreign invaders to enter the bloodstream and can cause an allergic response. By drinking aloe vera juice in a concentrated form daily, you provide the body with protein and flavonoids needed to address allergy sensitivity. While there are many beliefs on the topic of pH balance, I believe there are instances when acidity has a purpose or when it's maybe just misunderstood, especially in the realm of ingesting things deemed acidic versus alkaline. Aloe vera has an acidic pH, but it helps to encourage the body to secrete proper amounts of hydrochloric acid to improve digestion and absorption. When your body is able to access and absorb the proper nutrients, you can begin to build up the collagen and tissue structure to screen out the allergies. There's a glycomannan complex present in whole leaf aloe vera that helps to provide additional support to strengthen the tissue cell walls. Natural anti-inflammatory and analgesics found in the yellow sap of the aloe help to reduce swelling, pain, and skin irritation. Many skin issues come about as a result of toxins building up in the liver. Aloe vera juice has wonderful detoxifying properties. I just throw aloe juice in my smoothies, but you can drink it straight up, or if it's a little too bitter for you, add it to some fruit juice. Western herbalism suggests that aloe taken daily in combination with turmeric for at least three months can regulate liver function, which can in turn help counteract symptoms of premenstrual syndrome. Aloe vera contains amino acids, electrolytes, food enzymes, and essential fatty acids, all contributing to energy production by the body. Immune function is enhanced by the polysaccharides that aloe contains, as well as by stimulating macrophage, white blood cells, and lymphocyte production. Digestive function is greatly improved by the cathartic effect of the aloe, making it a gentle bowel mover. It helps the proper functioning of the glandular systems, the stomach, pancreas, gallbladder, and liver. It supports kidney function and detoxes the liver, colon, and skin. So as you can see, aloe vera is one of the most medicinal plants around. And it grows so easily here in Santa Barbara. So the next time you stay out in the sun too long or you're feeling a little backed up, look to aloe vera to help heal your ailments. I'm Sarah Remick and this has been Food for Thought for Yoga Santa Barbara Style. In vibrant health, be well. The Yoga Sutras of Patanjali are 196 Indian sutras or aphorisms that constitute the foundational text of Raja Yoga. Although the Yoga Sutras have become the most important text of yoga, Patanjali was not the creator of yoga, which existed well before him, but merely a great expounder. Patanjali was not the first to write about yoga. Other authors had written before him, and he used their writings in his text, which became the authority on the subject. In the Yoga Sutras, Patanjali prescribes adherence to eight limbs or steps to quiet the mind. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Yoga as a philosophical system is the practice of unifying one's body, mind, and spirit. The sutras not only provide yoga with a thorough and consistent philosophical basis, they also clarify many important esoteric concepts which are common to all traditions of Indian thought, such as karma, although these concepts are also addressed in other Hindu texts, such as the Bhagavad Gita. There are numerous distinctions between the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali and other Hindu texts, primarily in the fact that the Yoga Sutras emanate from but do not espouse Hinduism. That is, they may be considered sacred, but they're not religious. Compare this to the Bhagavad Gita, in which there is a necessary leap of faith, and the presentation is one from the mouth of one of the Hindu deities, Krishna. Patanjali's text presents a technique of meditative practice and reads like a manual for the practitioner interested in plumbing the depths of human consciousness 
rather than a philosophical or religious exposition. The eight limbs of yoga consists of the following. The first five are called external aids to yoga. The first is yama, which refers to the five abstentions. These five universal commandments are aimed at creating a better world. Second is niyama, which refers to the five observances, or rules of personal conduct. More about both of these in a moment. Then there's asana, discipline of the body. Pranayama, control of the breath. And pratyahara, control of the senses. This completes the first five limbs. The last three levels are called internal aids to yoga. The first of those is dharana, concentration, then dhyana, meditation, and the last is samadhi, achieving oneness with the object of meditation or absorption in the infinite. Now I'll briefly go over each of these. The goal of this presentation is simply to introduce the eight limbs of yoga as presented by Patanjali. In later episodes, we'll explore some of these concepts in greater detail. And for now, I'll leave the remaining Sanskrit out for the most part. We may explore that when we get into more detail at a later date. Back to the first limb, Yama, which consists of the five abstentions. Those five abstentions are nonviolence, inflicting no injury or harm to others or even to one's own self. It goes as far as nonviolence in thought, word, and deed. The second is truthfulness in word and thought. The third is non-covetousness to the extent that one should not even desire something that is his own. The fourth is responsible behavior with respect to our goal of moving toward the truth. It suggests that we should form relationships that foster our understanding of the highest truths. And the fifth is non-possessiveness. To sum these five abstentions up, they include non-violence, truth in word and thought, lack of envy, responsible behavior in relationships, and non-possessiveness. Next is the second limb, niyama. It consists of the five observances. The first is cleanliness of body and mind. The second is satisfaction, being satisfied with what one has. Third is austerity and associated observances for body discipline and thereby mental control. Fourth is the study of the scriptures to know more about God and the soul, which leads to introspection on a greater awakening to the soul and God within. And the fifth observance is surrender to or worship of God. The third limb is the limb of yoga that most of us are familiar with, asana, which are rules and postures to keep the body disease-free and for preserving vital energy. Correct postures are a physical aid to meditation for they control the appendages and nervous system and prevent them from producing disturbances. Pranayama is breath control, which is beneficial to health, steadies the body, and is highly conducive to the concentration of the mind. Pratyahara is control of the senses. Dharana is concentration, while dhyana is meditation. Samadhi, absorption in the infinite. This is considered a trance or state of bliss. The cumulative or collective mastery of the eight limbs aids one in performing samadhi efficiently. Samadhi then becomes the main tool used by the yogi to descend through the various layers of consciousness toward the very center of consciousness. Mastery of the eight limbs is only the prerequisite to begin the descent through consciousness to its center. The descent through consciousness involves mastery of samaskaras and overcoming kleshas and constitutes an effort of will perhaps greater than mastery of the eight limbs. This state is the fullness, completeness, and total freedom of being. Thus, the eight limbs are the means to samadhi, and samadhi is the means to the end, which is kaivalya. This concludes our first exploration into the eight limbs of yoga as presented in the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali. In future episodes, we'll explore the eight limbs in more depth. In the meantime, 
we'll continue our asana and pranayama practice and explore those limbs in our bodies and our minds. In peace and love, namaste. Thank mm -hmm. you.